Israelis have had it with the Supreme Court, they've had it with the left-wing politicized generals, and they've had it with the goon squads that were attacking the government for the past two years. I'll have all the details coming up on Info. Hello from Chicago, my last week away from Israel. Very, very looking forward to going home, but very happy to still be able to have some time with my family before I do. At any rate, um, what has been going on? Well, we all know that Israel is poised to absorb or perhaps hopefully preempt Iran's planned attack against Israel. It's massive escalation that it's promised. I'll be discussing that whole issue of what's going on in the war front in a special edition of the Carolyn Glick Show that I'm going to be taping tomorrow with my longtime friend and guest on the Carolyn Glick Show, strategic expert David Wormser in Washington. But in the meantime, I wanted to talk to you about what's going on in the domestic front because it has immediate impact on what's happening on the war front. So without further ado, I want to give you a couple of updates about what's been going on. We've seen a major shift in the way that Israeli society is dealing with our leftist elites. Just over the past couple of weeks, I sort of touched on a bit of it last week in my in focus, but uh, I want to go through a little bit more of it. So uh, I think last week I discussed the fact that uh, uh, Major General Yifat uh, Tomer Yerushalmi, the military advocate general of the IDF, ordered the arrest of 10 or 9 IDF reservists uh, being accused by a Hamas terrorist, a company commander in the Nukba squads of Hamas, the murder squads of Hamas that carried out the October 7th massacre, invasion and massacre atrocities in Israel on October 7th, that he accused them of abusing him while he was under their control at the State Tehran military base. And I discussed a little bit of their allegations. Well, uh, the, uh, the military advocate general ordered their arrest. They were arrested by um, by masked CID officers at State Tehran uh, last week, and all hell broke loose. You had hundreds and hundreds of Israelis descending on the uh, military base where the Hamas terrorists are housed, uh, demanding that the uh, soldiers be released and that uh, and that they not be punished for treating uh for for uh the treatment that uh they're giving to hamas terrorists who participated in october 7th then they were moved to bay lead base to be uh which is i guess uh, the military advocate general uses uh for arraignments and things like that and for his holding cells and so they were brought there and he still had you know dozens if not over a hundred uh civilians uh breaking into bait lead and demanding their release and ever since you've had uh crowds outside of uh uh, out outside of uh, Tomer Yerushalmi's house, uh, demanding their release, demanding her resignation from the army, etc., for going after the IDF, for going after the war fighters, for going after the soldiers. Five out of the ten soldiers that were arrested were released with no conditions. The other five still remain uh, in military jail pending indictment. But what works out now is that all of the charges against them have fallen apart. Charges that were leveled against them by these terrorists from Hamas uh, have fallen apart because everything that they do with prisoners at State Tehran is videotaped, and all videotaped evidence corroborates their story that they didn't do what they were accused of doing, which is essentially a group sodomizing of this uh, terrorist, and there's no indication whatsoever that that occurred at any point. Uh, in his incarceration, their claim that he was hiding a cell phone in his rectum, and as a result, he, he uh, sustained rectal damage, seems to be more reasonable. So rather than relent and cancel these uh, trumped-up charges that were brought by a terrorist against IDF reservists who've been serving in IDF reserves in uh, in this elite unit for guarding the most dangerous terrorists that Israel uh, took alive on October 7th, um, the uh, IDF uh, prosecution under the, the leadership of uh, Major General Tomer Yerushalmi is doubling down, and they want to bring the terrorists in as a prosecution witness against the soldiers. So this is something that's shocking to the overall public 
And uh, so she's been suffering these demonstrations, uh, much like the demonstrations that her leftist friends have been carrying out against Prime Minister Netanyahu and Likud members of Knesset, coalition members, cabinet ministers from all the coalition parties have been undergoing at the hands of left-wing shock troops who have been demonstrating and rioting in the streets of Israel first for 10 months preceding October 7th, and then uh, about five months after the war began when they figured uh, they had been nice uh, long enough and they went back into the streets this time, claiming that what they really cared about were, uh, were getting the hostages out. So the same kind of things with his horns and drums outside of her house. But the funny thing is that while these people are allowed to light bonfires and throw torches at policemen and all kinds of other things, assault elected leaders, and then not get uh, charged with anything uh, for as long as they want, all hours of the night, throughout the night, every day, um, starting at four o'clock in the morning. So the uh, protesters outside of uh, Tobi Yerushalmi's house are being told that after 10 o'clock, they're not allowed to make any noise in her neighborhood to disturb her neighbors, which is really something that's repeated itself throughout the past three years, which is that the state attorney who is enabling uh, the attorney general and the state's attorney who have been enabling these riots against the government for the past two years uh, are protecting their own. And that's why they're saying that members of their tribe, member of the legal fraternity on and uh, officers, etc., they're immune from uh, demonstrations. They can't be bothered in their homes. They can't be harassed. But you can harass the prime minister uh, outside of his home every day of the week. You know, during Shabbat, whatever you want, you can harass his family, you can attack his family, whatever you want, you can do that. But you're not allowed to uh, demonstrate loudly uh, late at night against these people. So, you know, I'm all for not being allowed to to demonstrate outside of everybody's home. But again, we have to have a rule of law here. You can't have a rule of law only for some people because that means that there is no rule of law. That means that there is a political rule that's being wielded by people with legal power. And that's basically what we've seen all along, and that's what we saw today with uh, with rally or demonstration or whatever you want to call it outside of the uh, military advocate general's home for her action against IDF reservists, which, you know, I'll just say, you know, the impact here is really devastating for Israel. Not only does it demoralize the public to see our war fighters treated like common criminals or even worse, war criminals, um, we're seeing that, you know, you have, you have, uh, uh, echoes of this resonating throughout. So if she thought that by attacking our own war fires, by treating them like war criminals, that this was going to get us off from charges from the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice, that's ridiculous because what she's actually doing is fueling them, saying, oh, look, you know, uh, she's doing it, so we're right to be pursuing these uh, trumped-up charges against the idea of trumped-up charges against Israel's political leadership, etc. So they're actually fueling the allegations. They're not they're not undermining them. I saw any number of demonstrations over the past week against the IDF where they're saying that our soldiers sodomize poor Palestinians. So this is all because of her. This is all her fault. This is all the fault of the IDF uh, military advocate general's unit that seems to think that they are allowed to adopt their own war fighting uh, policies. And so they're not getting away with it. The public won't have it. They're not, nobody's accepting the legitimacy of what she's doing. And she's under a lot of pressure. The chief of staff is under a lot of pressure to fire her. Uh, the prime minister is under a lot of pressure to fire the IDF chief of staff, Herzl Levy. So, I mean, this is going and they're not getting any respite from this. And the same is true of their bosses uh, of the military advocate general's unit, of the attorney general in the, in the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court has been listening to all of these petitions over the past couple of weeks. Uh, by terror supporters, by radical foreign government funded NGOs that are calling for, you know, Israel to provide medical services for Gazans inside of Israel, et cetera, and, you know, uh, give them more aid, more this. So last week they did that in the Supreme Court and they were shouted down. They were protested by uh, hostages' families demanding that uh, the Supreme Court stop hearing them, and the lawyers from these radical uh, NGOs were were subjected to shouts of shame on you by the hostages' families, by the families of fallen Israeli soldiers who came to the hearing using their right to appear at uh, Supreme Court hearings in order to demonstrate. And so let's speak of more. I just want to show you his son, Eitan Moore, is being held hostage by Hamas. He 
uh, asked to address the court, and rather than listen to him, the Supreme Court justices just walked out in unison together uh, from the courtroom. And so Tzvika Moore, who was a guest on our show, talking about uh, the uh, Tikva form, the hope form that he and, and another over 40 hostages families uh, established, demanding that there be no deal uh, that leaves hostages behind and that Israel not surrender to Hamas's demands, but actually that the only way to really get the hostages home, uh, all of them, is by defeating Hamas completely and, and securing that goal of the war, the military goals of the war, not just re to reserve that, that they're connected, that you can only get the hostages home if you beat Hamas. So they don't want to deal. And so I just want you to watch here what Svika is saying about why he is protesting at the Supreme Court. <laughs> לו בית המשפט הזה היה דוחה על הסף ומגלגל מכל המדרגות את אותם ארגוני זכויות אדם כמו יש דין, האגודה לזכויות האזרח, הדלה, גישה והמוקד להגנת הפרט שמאז חודש מרץ 2018 מארגנים את צעדות השיבה לעבר הגדר ומחבלים בה כל העתירות הללו של אויבי מדינת ישראל וחבריהם הבוגדים מבני עמנו נועדו לחרסם ביכולת של ישראל להגן על עצמה לו בית המשפט הזה היה מאפשר את המובן מאליו והמקובל בכל מדינה דמוקרטית ומתוקנת לראות בכל מי שמתקרב לגדר הגבול וכאן וחומר מי שמחבל בה בני איתן היה היום בבית אם בית המשפט הוא המילה האחרונה במדינה ואינו נתון לשום ביקורת אז הוא הריבון במדינה בשבועות האחרונים ארגונים החפצים בהשמדת המדינה משתמשים בזכות העמידה שבית משפט זה מקנה להם ועותרים לטובת האויב. האם סיימתם לדאוג לבני עמכם? האם מישהו מכם הרים טלפון למישהו ממשפחות החטופים בערב חנוכה, בערב פסח, כדי לאחל חג שמח? לא אכפת לכם מאיתנו. בית המשפט הזה, שמשרת את האויב, so right, so he's saying, you guys think of yourself as a sovereign power in Israel. Okay, so we've been going to the Knesset, we've been going to all these hearings, but they don't have the power. Now we know you guys have all the power, so we're coming to you. So the same thing happened on Sunday, and this is really interesting. What happened was the Supreme Court accepted that the Palestinian Authority, a foreign, hostile uh, political entity, has standing before the court. This is sort of shocking that uh, the Supreme Court would do this while, particularly while this foreign entity is engaged in war against Israel, warlike activities against Israel, by among other things, funding, salaries, payments to terrorists who are sitting in Israeli prisons because they've been convicted of terrorism and the families of terrorists who conducted murderous terrorist attacks against Israel. This, by the way, includes the Hamas terrorists who invaded Israel and murdered 1,200 Israelis on October 7th and took 250 of them uh, hostage to Gaza. The ones that were killed, the ones that are in Israeli prison, are also receiving uh, salaries from the Palestinian Authority, which, as we all know, is funded by the U.S. government, courtesy of the Biden administration that renewed the funding to the Palestinian Authority uh, that President Trump ended because of their uh, their payments to terrorists. Um, uh, and so the Biden administration is funding this Palestinian Authority, but the after October 7th, the Knesset passed a law that said that because they continue to fund terrorists and pay the salaries of terrorists, that in addition to the damages that the victims of terrorism and the families of, of victims of terrorism who were killed by terrorists, uh, received from national insurance from, from the Israeli government, they're also allowed to sue the Palestinian Authority for punitive damages, and the law sets a ceiling for what they can get for, you know, if they if their loved one was murdered or if they were wounded, you can get X million shekels, I think 5 million shekels if they were killed, then you can get, I think, 3 million shekels if they were wounded, some such thing. They're punitive damages against the Palestinian Authority, the, and the Palestinian Authority petitioned the Supreme Court to actually cancel the law that the Knesset passed, which is shocking on two levels. One is who gave them the authority to abrogate this law. They did. They took it for themselves. But the other one is how can you give standing to the Palestinians? So here you can see 
a bunch of uh, families of uh, bereaved families of terror victims who were murdered by the Palestinian Authority, by Palestinian Authority security services that are being, or terrorists who are being funded by the Palestinian Authority um, are there, as well as families uh, whose soldiers have been killed, and they're flipping out. And they 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 uh, shame the attorneys who are representing the Palestinian Authority, shame on you. Of this outside of the courtroom and then inside of the courtroom they started uh also screaming about it why not right because if this is the sovereign look i mean netanyahu and all the members of knesset they all have to get screamed at all the time they have to give it an accounting to uh the public they have to call up people who, you know the hostage channels they have to meet with them they have to do all of these things so you know if 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 the supreme court has just seized the power of the government to deal with uh, national security and it's taking over security policy without any permission from the governed, well, then the government governed has a right to go and protest against the actions of the sovereign, which now is the Supreme Court. So they're going there because that's right, because it's probably right. You know, you want us to take over the kitchen, so you get all the heat. So here, take the heat. And so what's really funny here, and I hope that this is the beginning of a process that we'll see is that after the, after the Supreme Court started hearing this petition and the Palestinian authorities, attorneys presented their case, so and even before the government presented its, its case opposing the abrogation of the law, uh, the, uh, the judges announced that they were going to reject the petition and that they were going to order that the uh, Palestinian Authority pay the court costs, which is really interesting right? because here they are, they're beginning to feel heat and they're relenting because they see they're now being treated as politicians they are. Of course, they're not real politicians. They've swallowed the political system and they're they're ruling by judicial fiat. And they thought that they have no accountability. And the public has finally said, no, 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 no. You don't get away with this. You are accountable to us because you're you're leading in our name, even though nobody gave you that permission, nobody gave you that power. But if you've seized it, then you have to answer to us. So this is really new. This has started over the past couple of weeks, and kudos to, um, I kind of remember what they're called in English, it's the uh, movement, let me see if I can find it. That's not it, I have a bunch of tabs open by computer, let's see if I can find it. It's the uh, movement for governability and accountability, It was established first by, uh, join me, by uh, by attorney uh, Simcha Rothman, who's now the head of the uh, Knesset's uh, Constitution, Law and Governance um, uh, Committee, and by attorney Sabina, who's uh, both of them are, are friends of mine, and he's Scott is now leading it. It's, she's been organizing the movement for uh, govern governability or governing accountability has and democracy has has been organizing these citizens to come and protest that Supreme Court. And it's a very effective thing to do because again, kudos to maybe Skabina for uh, taking up this initiative, very important. And then, um, you know, in the meantime, they're not the only ones who are getting it on the heads. Uh, you also have a security brass who's getting it on their heads. Security brass being the chief of staff of the army, Herzl Levy, Ronan Barr, the head of the Shabak, you know, these are the people who are responsible, most responsible for the colossal failure of October 7th because they didn't understand what Hamas was doing because they had this idea in their head that Hamas was deterred, nothing to worry about, et cetera, et cetera. And the real problem was the threat that Netanyahu posed to democracy. We'll get to that in a second. So they had all this information, right? Shabak was responsible for gathering up all of the human intelligence, signal intelligence, even more than military intelligence was in Gaza. They totally dropped the ball. They didn't know what to do. We can go through how totally irresponsible Renan Barr was on October 6th when he found out about uh, all kinds of things that were happening in Gaza. When he found out about all kinds of things that were happening in Gaza just hours before they they uh, initiated the invasion and he drew all the wrong decisions as a result of them. The guy is totally incompetent and he's now you know, together with the head of the Mossad, he's running the hostage truck. So I want to, uh, so they have been uh, attacking, leading a major push to demonize Netanyahu. And this has been going on for months when uh, of, uh, of negotiations, of hostage negotiations with Hamas that are being mediated by the CIA and all the rest of it. So, 
you have the steady leaks to the media that Netanyahu is opposed to the hostage deal, that were it not for Netanyahu, we would have a, a hostage deal, that everybody would help be home, except Netanyahu doesn't care about the hostages. And so this has been going on, that for days, that for weeks, but for months and months. And we have, and the main person who's been leaking, according to people who are in the know, and I, this is not my direct knowledge, but what I've understood from people who do know, is Nitsan Alon. Nitsan Alon is a reserve major general of the army. He's one of the politicized generals, one of the many political generals who are members of the radical left, acted as such when they were in the army. Nitsan Alon was a, a, the governor, the, the commanding officer in Central Command, which is responsible for Judea and Samaria, and he just implemented policies that were in line, aligned with the positions of the radical left, uh, against the vast majority of Israelis undermining the government's policies on Judea and Samaria, because he could, because in Judea and Samaria was, has not yet been incorporated into sovereign Israel, so it's governed by military law, and the military sovereign, essentially, in Judea and Samaria is the commanding officer of Central Command. So he, despite the fact that he's supposed to be accountable to the defense ministry, the chief of staff of the defense minister, Ultimately, to the government, he acted as an independent authority. We've had a lot of that from central command commanders in the IDF over the past, you know, three decades since Oslo, and even before that. And so he did that in sort of the vein of his radical leftist predecessors, and then they inevitably become, you know, heads of the Labor Party or whatever. So that's Nitzan alone, and he was brought in by Herzl Levy um, in a massive move of. Uh, subversion, I would say, a political subversion, to be Halevi's representative in the hostage talk. So you have this radical leftist who was actually politically engaged before he was brought into this position after October 7th. Uh, he was part of the generals trying to bring down the government before October 7th, and then Herzl Halevi ropes him in, and he puts him in this position that he's the chief IDF negotiator. Okay, on the hostage. So he's a very senior member of the hostage of the hostage negotiations with Hamas. And so he's been figured this all along as the main source for leaks against that are that, that seek to demonize Netanyahu, not Sinwar, as the reason why we haven't reached a deal on the hostage release yet. That it's all Netanyahu's fault and everything would be fine. And in recent weeks, we've gotten these stories one after the other after the other. The Shin Bet, that the IDF are fine with the Hamas's conditions, which require a full IDF withdrawal from Gaza in exchange for uh, a fraction of the hostages home. We don't even know it's 20, 30 out of 115, so you're leaving the vast majority of hostages behind in Gaza. No indication of how many are alive, no indication of who is going to be released because Hamas won't give us any names, right? Nothing, no information on the status of the 115. We know already that at least 40 of them are dead, but we don't know about the rest. And Hamas won't give us any information. So they basically, when they say that they want this deal, what they say is we want the end of the war. Because if you do, and we want to lose, because you want Israel to withdraw from the Philadelphia corridor, from the Netzarim corridor, Philadelphia, and I'll just show you this picture. You know, if you haven't seen it already, this is a tunnel that went, that the Hamas, and I would assume Egypt, uh, or certainly Egypt enabled um, the burrowing of, burrowed through the Egyptian border. This is a tunnel uh, that a, that a small truck can fit through, right? That's that's what we see here, is that this is a massive tunnel. It's for vehicles to pass through, and they did, I'm sure. So what's interesting is that the IDF is discovered this 10 days ago, and they didn't want it published because it was going to embarrass Egypt. So the reason why it even got to the media and the idea of spokesman's unit was supposed to, was forced to publish it was to acknowledge that it was true, that this happened along the border with, that this exists along the border between Gaza and Egypt is because IDF soldiers sent the pictures on their own to reporters because they couldn't believe that the IDF was suppressing this information. So, you know, this is, this is what just happened, you know, and so now the IDF spokesman's unit is chasing this story, and it works at. They have another tunnel that they've exposed that has tracks in it, so it's like a conveyor for massive amounts of arms to go into Gaza and carts. So I don't think it was a railway, but whatever. So you see industrial level smuggling, 
of arms that's enabled by Egypt. Um, very frightening, by the way, what this means about Egypt and the Sisi regime that Israel has long been perhaps the most out outspoken supporter of. At any rate, um, so last Thursday, I think it was, it came out, or Friday night, it came out that um, Ronen Bar and Nitzan alone are saying to Netanyahu, you're blocking this deal. How can you block this deal that would, you know, require Israel to give up everything that all of our hard-won gains, literally hard-won gains, uh, and give and allow uh, Yahya Sinwar to remain in power, rebuild his power, and then they say, oh, we can go back anytime we want. Such a lie. Anyway, so you're doing it. And so Netanyahu said, I don't understand why you're attacking the Prime Minister of Israel and not Yahya Sinwar. I think you guys are terrible negotiators. So Channel 2, uh, Channel 12, I guess it is now, uh, in Israel, is sort of the repository of all the left-wing poison against Netanyahu. It's really on Friday nights when you don't have religious viewers of television and Channel 14 is off the air because they don't broadcast them for it on Friday nights. So anyway, so Channel four, Channel 12, which is a very left-wing pro uh, uh, station, and on Friday night they're particularly left-wing because they know that no right-wingers or very few right-wingers are watching them because they're all observing Shabbat, or many of them are. So they allow themselves to be even more radical. So they give this story. It's based on security sources telling their military affairs reporter that Netanyahu was accused by Renan Bar um, and uh, and by others and by Halevi of blocking the deal, even though it doesn't cause any security damage, which is manifestly insane. And so Netanyahu uh, answered them back, "You're terrible negotiators. You know you should be putting the pressure on Sinwar, not on me." And what was funny was they thought, because they always think, because they're always sure that when they say nasty things by Netanyahu, that he is the one blocking the did da that it's going to get him in trouble, and then he's going to be on the defensive, and then he's going to make concessions so that he doesn't lose public support because he's a politician. That's really all he cares about, right? So what was funny was, the story comes out Friday night, and on Saturday night, People who are on the right, and even before that, people who are on the right who saw this, so, said, great, Netanyahu is absolutely right. We totally support Netanyahu. He's totally right. What kind of nonsense is this, right? It's funny. And so actually, Channel 14 did a poll uh, that came out on uh, Sunday night about, you know, what does the public want uh, for a deal? What kind of deal are the, are, are, what kind of hostage deal? Is, is the public willing to get. So they gave various parameters of the deal on the table. So for instance, they said, are you um, are you ready for a deal? Uh, are you for or against a deal that will allow Yahya Sinwar to remain in power and rebuild his regime in Gaza? Because that's part of the deal that's on the table right now. And the answer is that 64% of Israelis opposed it, 30% of Israelis support it, and 6% have no opinion. They ask, uh, are you, um, no, I'm sorry, it's 68% opposed, 30% support, and 6% have no opinion. And then they have another question that says, uh, are you, are you for a two-stage deal that in, on, in the first stage we get around 30 out and then the rest are left for later stages, which is what's on the table, right? It's only, we're only talking about uh, a quantity of, of hostages that are going to be released, presumably, God willing, alive in the first stage. We still don't know what's going to happen to the remaining hostages, uh, 85 hostages who are who are left behind, right? And and so they say, what do you think of that? That we'll only get them in later stages because that's the heart of the deal. And the answer is that here too, you have 64%, like I said, yeah. that was the answer, 64% oppose it. 30% support it, and 6% have no opinion. So this is, you know, we're talking about two-thirds and above of Israelis who oppose the parameters of the deal, much like Prime Minister Netanyahu does. Then they say, well, who's better at negotiating? And they have three choices. They can have Netanyahu, they can have Gantz, and they can have Lapid. So it works out 45% of Israelis say they prefer Netanyahu be in charge. That's more or less the route of Israelis who prefer him as Prime Minister. And then you have Gantz, trailing behind 24 points behind at 21%, and Lapid even further behind at 16%. So you're seeing that 21, 16, that's 37. 37, so both of them together 
are eight coins less than Netanyahu. And then you have 15% say none of them. And another 3% think said that they have no opinion. So, so the public wants Netanyahu to lead this negotiations because they trust him more than they trust these generals who are leaking against him and, and accusing him rather than say, Yafia Sinwar of blocking the deal. So what's notable here are two things. First of all, for the first time uh, in recent weeks, the head of Mossad, who's the, also one of the leaders of the negotiating team, uh, David Barnea, who's been silent on this thing, or with Herzl Levy, he changed sides. Over the past few weeks, he's been saying, I, I, I agree with Netanyahu. Netanyahu is right. We can't have this. And second of all, so that's first of all, so you can't talk about all of the security establishment because the head of Mossad isn't with them. That's the first thing that's different. And the second thing that's even more shocking is that it was reported today by Amit Segov, the top political correspondent in Israel, always gets all the scoops. That Nitzan alone just met with the same general, the same political general who's been leaking all this stuff against Netanyahu for months, right, from the negotiating table, allegedly, from people who I, I, I believe who have credible information about it. Amit Segal reported today that he met with the hostages families, the same, you know, few hostages families who have been demanding a deal at all costs, et cetera, et cetera. And they're massively supported by the by the media, even though Tika Moore and and his uh, hope for, which gets no support from from media outside of Channel 14 and uh Gala Israel Radio, more or less, and of course JNS, um, they uh they have more hostages families represented by then, but the only people who get to be on TV as the, as the hostage families forum are a much smaller number of hostages families who want to deal at all costs. And it's not that I judge them. You know, if their kids are there, I don't know. I, I don't want to judge people in that situation. Um, you know, But there are less families represented by their group than are represented by the whole forum. Anyway, so a neat side alone met with and according to Amit Segal, he said to them, look, you know, Hamas never agreed to Biden's deal, the one that he presented as Israel's deal on uh, May, I think, 25th or something like that. I did a whole show on it, and you can check it out, where, why I explained that it doesn't make any sense what he said was Netanyahu's position, but whatever, he presented it as Israel's deal. And um, so Nitzahal said, look, you know, it's not Netanyahu that rejects it. It's Sinwar. So Hamas keeps putting more and more conditions on the deal that make it a totally different deal. And Netanyahu, in the meantime, made clarifications. And I have substantive disagreements with him about what he's doing. But it's totally within the bounds of what the parameters that Biden set out are. So you you, you can't say that he is the one that's blocking a deal, which is the first time that Nitzan alone has ever said anything supportive of Netanyahu. Now, what do we learn from this? Nitzan alone is a political activist. He was when he was wearing uniform. He was when he was out of uniform. Now that he's in reserves, active reserves, uh, doing the hostage deal, he was also, he's also been a political activist the whole time, leaking all of the information, et cetera, according to the report. And he's saying... Netanyahu is totally within the realm of legitimate. He's doing exactly what his it's his right to do as prime minister. What's he doing? With? Well, he's doing that because of the poll. He's doing it because of the public support for Netanyahu's position because he sees that they've lost the public on the hostage deal, that it's not going to work for them. That the public, you know, as I reported uh, in my call that uh, I put out last Friday, you know, that the public wants victory. You know, you have over two thirds of Israelis who are saying, wait, 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 we don't, you know, if we will fight for as long as it takes, right? That was another poll that came out last week on Channel 14. Direct Pulse is doing all the fun, by the way. They were doing it for us too, but me being away in Chicago, it's hard for me to get it all together. Sorry. It will get more when I get home. So Direct Pulse put out this poll last week again with, with uh, Channel 14. You can check out my article to get the exact data. But here, too, you know, they asked Israelis, you know, how long are you willing to keep up the fight? And two thirds of Israelis said, as long as it takes, you know, and and that's it. You know, we're not willing to fight to a draw. We want victory. That's what the Israelis are saying. Who is demanding victory of all of Israel's leaders? Is it the anonymous sources and the IDF? No. 
It's the prime minister. Is it the defense minister who's been in open rebellion against the Netanyahu's opening things of the government? No, it's not. It's one person. It's Netanyahu, and the public is standing with him. So Nitzan alone and all of his fellow political generals were like, okay, no, we're going to stop for now. We're not going to work. This is a loser for us. We're not going to continue on with them. So you have the IDF military advocate general. She thought, oh, I'm going to arrest our war fighters, charge them with things that they're that are being alleged by Hamas murdering rapist terror commander from October 7th is being held uh, by the IDF in a holding stand. And why was he there? Was because he had been at a civilian prison with other security services. So, um, prisoners from October 7th, from Hamas terrorists from October 7th. He was moved to the IDF holding facility because he tried to incite a prison riot of Hamas terrorists against uh, prison authorities. So they moved him to say, Army, you're responsible for it. And then he put out this allegation, which has already fallen apart under the IDF's own investigation of it, right? After she had bells and whistles on, sent in mass CID officers from military police and to arrest these reservists who have been on since basically October 7th, left their houses in order to do this thankless job of securing Hamas terrorists, right? She arrests them as if they're war criminals, demonizes Israel abroad, has, you know, provided risk for these pro-Hamas terror, uh, terror, spots, terror supporters demonstrating against the IDF all over the Western world. Thank you very much. And empower the ICC and the ICJ to continue prosecuting these completely groundless allegations against our soldiers and our officers and our and our political leaders. She did all of this because she thought it was a great idea. And now she's paying a price because nobody wants her to remain in, jo in her job anymore, essentially, among the public. She's And... She's getting it in the chin because the public isn't going to let her off just because she wasn't elected. If she's seizing the power of the elected leaders of Israel, then she's going to be treated like one. And that's exactly what's happening outside of her house. Look at what the Supreme Court did on Sunday. No, 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 we're not going to accept this petition from the PA. And while you have, mem you have members of the public, the bereaved families, in the courtroom saying, how dare you, shame on you, right? Suddenly, you have to be accountable to the public. They realize that that means something. They're starting to realize the burden of it all. And finally, I want to want to finish this, I think, optimistic story, Ryan, of the public standing up and saying, no, you can't do this to us anymore with the Brothers and Sisters in Arms rack. Okay, so Brothers and Sisters in Arms is, a, is an anarchist group, basically, of very privileged members of Israel Security Authority. It was founded, works out, by officers who uh, who served in Israel's most elite commander unit, Sayyid Mak, and it, among other things, one of the leaders was uh, was is the son of the former chief of staff of the IDF. Uh, where is his name here? Oh, Itamar Mofaz. So Shal Mofaz, his father was former IDF chief of staff. His brother Yonatan is the commander of Sayyid Matkal until. I think a couple of weeks ago or months ago. So, you know, like now on October 7th. And so he and his friends, these reserve officers from Sayyid Matkal, um, founded Brothers in Arms. And what's the point of Brothers in Arms? The point of Brothers in Arms is to overthrow the government by threatening uh, anybody who stands up to the legal fraternity, anybody who, um, who whether in, in uh, civil society or in the government. So Brothers in Arms, they had mass riots outside of the homes of members of Knesset, members of the coalition, uh, where they harassed elected leaders of Israel day after day, week after week, month after month in their homes, harassed their children, terrorized their families month after month uh, in the lead up to October 7th, and the, from the time that the government essentially was formed in December of 2022 until October 7th. Right, so that's what they were doing. They went after the Kohelet Forum, my friends, the Kohelet Forum, right? They they uh, they barricaded Kohelet's offices uh, in Jerusalem with barbed wire and garbage. They physically attacked it, attacked the CEO of Kohelet when he was out having dinner with his wife. When he came out to meet with them, they started shoving fake dollars into his collar, 
we, these are anti-Semitic acts and they're, they're mob violence and they were engaging them. And they, the, one of the CEOs of Achim Lanesh was there overseeing this whole thing. Nothing happened to him. You know, they're like, because, because the legal fraternity is for them because they're for the maintenance of the extraordinary powers of the Supreme Court and the Attorney General and anybody who stands up to the, the democratically elected government of Israel and its representatives in the Knesset, they're they get total immunity from law because Israel is a, has the rule of lawyers, not the rule of law under the current regime. So they got off for all of their massive felonies. In fact, it's one big criminal complex because its whole goal is to undermine Israeli democracy through mob violence. So that's what they were doing until October 7th. And what's interesting, and the worst thing that Achim Lanesh, which is brothers in arms, in English they call themselves brothers and sisters, and they're show that, you know, whatever, they're pluralistic or aggressive or whatever. Um, the worst thing that they did was they organized mass refusal to serve among soldiers and officers in elite units. And so that included Sayyid Makal, of course, where they all came from. That included a lot of other. Uh, commando units that included uh, the Air Force, Air Force pilots uh, in the key in the key um, uh, squadrons, fighter squadrons, F F-15 squadrons, etc. In the army, of saying they were going to show up, uh, brigadier generals in the Air Force who served in the command bunker of the IDF of the IAF, the Israel Air Force, that's responsible for controlling the. The air, air, aerial operations, the operations control. So these are, you know, senior people, and they were and they were waging an extortionate a campaign of extortion against the government. We're going to destroy the IDF. We are destroying the IDF. Ten thousand people agreed to answer uh, the brothers in arms uh, call to refuse to serve in reserves. Okay, and then. This was open. They called for it openly. And they were proud of themselves. They were on 60 Minutes, you know, bragging that they got 10,000 members of the idea of reserve substance. So these were acts that they did of civil rebellion, of sedition, and felony assaults on law abiding citizens caused massive damage. So Kohelet, uh, not only did they operate against Kohelet inside of Israel, but they spent months, their friends, their colleagues in the United States, um, uh, harassing, humiliating, waging a massive public campaign against Arthur Danchik, um, Kohelet's uh, funder, his, their main funder, until he decided he couldn't take it anymore and he announced that he was going to stop funding Kohelet and almost their entire budget was from his contribution. So Kohelet started been falling apart since last August when he announced it just a, week, a year ago because they have to suddenly find somebody to fund their operations. One of the most important think tanks in Israel, this was because of what Ayan Levin and the, the brothers in arms did to them. So, and then they bragged about it. I talked about it at the time. Anyway, so these are violent people and they took a hack thought to the idea. So then October 7th comes. Oh, before October 7th, you had statements by Hamas leaders, spokesmen, Iranian spokesmen, government spokesmen, leaders, uh, Hezbollah spokesmen and leaders saying, look, the IDF has fallen over. Look, Israel is destroying itself. Obviously, what is the lesson? Now is the time to attack. And anybody with eyes in their head who saw what Brothers in Arms did in the 10 months that preceded October 7th couldn't come away with anything other than a conviction that this organization played a role, a significant made, made a significant contribution to Hamas's decision, to Iran's decision, to Hezbollah's decision to invade Israel on October 7th. Because here you see the IDF is falling apart. We have we have warnings that the Air Force is no longer functioning from the Air Force Command, right? From from the chief of staff of the IDF. The Galid Dista of Artiana, one of the sort of uh the passionaries of the Likud. Uh, she announced yesterday, she told yesterday that when she was a uh, minister for a brief period at the beginning of the government, in the government, she, whatever, it's a story. Uh, she got a call after she came out against the people refusing to serve uh, from the chief of staff, from Herzliya Levy, who said, 
that they're causing real damage to the IDF and that they're in specialized positions that the IDF absolutely requires and that uh, it's going to take six years, not, you know, they can't just re be replaced. These aren't lying soldiers. These people cannot be replaced. That it takes six years, the IDF needs six years to train other people to, do the, to perform the uh, actions that these officers who were refusing to serve in reserves uh, were, were performing for the IDF. So this was significant substantive damage to the IDF, according to what Galit Dissel said. Uh, Herzia Levy told her. So this is massive damage, and it, and Netanyahu was completely freaked out over his, you know, recorded banging on the table saying this is treason, you have to take care of it, and then the IDF did not take care of it at all because they were too afraid, because they were paralyzed, because they were their friends for many number, any number of reasons. They didn't do it. And so this was going on, and then October 7th happened. We were, we were invaded. So, you know, it was obvious to most Israelis that Achim Leneshek, the brothers in arms, played a role in this. That they contributed to what happened. They reinvested and invented themselves immediately. They changed the name of their operation from brothers in arms to the uh, civ civilian operations room. The Hamala is It's called in Hebrew. The, the the civil the civilian war room, and they said they were organizing. Uh, equipment for the IDF. They were organizing assistance to the farmers in the South. And, you know, they, the same media that was supporting them in their acts of mayhem and riot and civil war, basically, uh, in the 10 months preceding October 7th, continued to give them lavish coverage for their war room and look at all these operations that they're doing, that they're giving out all of this assistance to the kibbutzim, to, uh, to military units, etc. So they get all of this positive coverage for their new, improved looks, and now they're running the country. Now they're making sure that everything runs smoothly because they're the best, because they are tech people, they're high-tech people, they're putting together computer programs to help locate the hostages. That never happened, but whatever. So they, they have all this glory. They're getting all of this credit. And guess what? They raised an enormous amount of money. So our Baloo one of the uh, great uh, Twitter feeds that uh, I've talked about in the past that showed um, other damning information about um, the ties between these protest groups and the Biden administration some months ago. So he came out, our bell, with uh, more information from uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, requests that he made to Israel's registrar of nonprofits. He received the budget. Uh, the money, the donations, information on all the donations that uh, the the Brothers at Arms group got uh, since uh, during the year of 2023. So that's, you know, it's uh, 10 years preceding, 10 months preceding October 7th, and then two months after, after they rebranded themselves. And just to be clear, you know, after October 7th, all of diaspora juries started, just opened up their wall and started giving money to Israel, right? Because they were under attack. We're about, you know, we, we suffered the one day Holocaust is terrifying what's happening. People started giving a lot of money, a lot of money. And they were right there with their shovels and a big bag to throw it in. So you know, they got money not only from uh, people who are like-minded, they got money from people who wanted to give equipment to military units in the IDF, you know, get them ceramic vests, get them better helmets, get them this, get them that, get them all the things they need, canteens, etc. And they were sure to put a sticker from Brothers in Arms on every piece of equipment that they donated to IDF units so that everybody would know that it was given by the good people who were responsible for trying to take apart the IDF for 10 months ahead of October 7th. And it was really interesting. Like they came to a lot of places, including the Kibbutzim, with their Achim Leneshek, with their Brothers in Arms T-shirts. They're always olive green, and they have very, you know, like a, a blue and white uh, lettering because they're, you know, they're soldiers, whatever. And so they come in, and at Ofakim, and at some of the Kibbutzim also, people told them to go away. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. It, the public hates them. The public didn't want them. Like, if you really want to help us, why are you coming with your T-shirt? Come, come with normal folks. You know, why are you coming as this group? And, you know, so they rebranded themselves, but they didn't really because they're all still wearing their logos. They're still wearing their T-shirts. They're still identifying themselves as the brothers and arms, etc. So people didn't want that. So that was the first indication that, uh-oh, you know, we have a problem with the public.
but they didn't care they because they want to go into politics a lot of them etc so works out and i went over the uh data myself today they raised since uh, i mean through through october through through december 31st 2023 they raised 140 million shekels it's about but like uh, forty million dollars, more or less, and uh, about two thirds of it was from abroad, a third of it from Israeli donors. Okay, and they got it from institutional donors too. They got it from the Jewish Federations of North America. Jewish Federations of North America. I give you a little bit of information on them because it's pretty amazing. So they raised. After October twenty, after October seventh, they raised a half a billion dollars, five hundred fifty-three million seven hundred eighty-three thousand six hundred ninety dollars. Okay. Um, they've allocated one hundred twenty-one million six hundred ninety-seven thousand two hundred forty-one dollars from their report. So breakdown of allocations, kind of uh, collective donations and federated. So fifty-three million are collective al allocations, and sixty-eight percent are federation delegated allocations. So what the federation wants, the rest of them fifty-three million is what people who donate said they want. You know, go bring my money to here, bring my money. So the largest total allocations, Jewish agency got thirty-two million. And Local municipalities, regional councils got fifteen million. The Joint Distribution Committee; these are all, you know, government affiliated groups. Uh, J the Georgia Distribution seven point seven million dollars. Then what is the fourth largest grantee from the Jewish Federations of North America? Brothers and Sisters for Israel. That's that five point three mil, five point three million. And then that's just you know what uh, the the. Jewish Federations of North America, you have the Jewish Federations and you have the, the Jewish National Fund in Britain, you have it in America, you have all over the country, all over the world, you have these Jewish donor, donors, institutional donors that are giving them millions of shekels. So, you know, this is, this is amazing, right? Uh, five minutes ago, they were the most active anarchistic organization. A couple of weeks ago, Channel 14 had, uh, had an expose Boaz Golan, a reporter, donors in LA who were buying equipment for military units in the IDF were told uh, they bought it all on the basis of what their friends in these units asked them for. So they were buying for specific units that they were in contact with and be specifically what they want. There is hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. They bought it. They want to transfer it. So the IDF says to them, we have to work with brothers and sisters in arms because they have the best operation. And if you go through the list of all the donors, what I did today, you know that a lot of these groups, they did it because they were told by the IDF or by people on the ground, look, you got to give it through this group, even though we hate them, even though they're problematic, they're political, they're the best organized, right? So they've set up this infrastructure, they're the best. Okay, so they get 140 million shekels worth of stuff from federations, from even Mizrahi in, in Canada, I understand, give them. They get all this information. They get all this day, money. How much of it do they spend? So looking at their annual report, it works out that they spent about a quarter of that money, right? They got 140,000, 100, 140 million in, in donations, more or less. You can assess it at higher than that. I saw, I, I'm not quite sure, Arbalu, who I trust, he said 160 million, but I saw 140, so let's go with my lower number. They spent 45 million. So that's 95 million. What is it for? Where is it? Why was it allocated? Moreover, the data in their annual report shows that they spent uh, more than twice what they spent on you know, helping soldiers, helping uh, you know, distributing the actual aid to farmers, et cetera, that they receive, that they raise, they spend more than twice that on advertising for the organization. So branding, advertising, et cetera, that was the chief outlay. It wasn't assistance. And again, 95 million shekels wasn't allocated. So you could say, and I agree, you know, maybe it wasn't all allocated by December 31st. Maybe they're allocating it after, but still, 
they have a huge amount of money. And by the way, their fundraising didn't end on December 31st. They continue to fundraise. So they're fundraising at more than four times what they're, or near, nearly four times what they're allocating, right? And they rebranded themselves as suddenly as the war room, the civil war room, right? That's responsible for all this stuff. But they're wearing their shirts that are all their political activism shirts for, for that, and people don't want them. But that's it. They it, they instigated themselves there. So what's interesting about that, along the lines that I said, that, you know, the people of Israel just have had it, right, with the left, is that they, after the after the war started, they, they started making these ridiculous claims. Ron Sheriff came to the Knesset and said, I never called for refusing to serve in the idea. And there are literally reams of videotape showing him doing precisely that, right? All of them are on record. They were on 60 minutes saying, yeah, 10,000 people aren't serving in the army and that's good, right? They were with Leslie Stahl. Leslie Stahl. So, like, it's all out there and they're denying it in real time. And in the past, could have worked for them. It could have worked for them, maybe, you know, it worked for them. Right. While they were doing it, they were saying, no, we're not calling for pilots not to serve. We're calling them for them to stop volunteering. It's not the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. I'm not going to volunteer anymore. I'm going to stop serving. It's the same thing. <laughs> like, there's no difference. And no matter how many times we said that, the media kept repeating their lie that there was this distinction between a term of art that's used for Air Force pilots and uh, the term that's used for everybody normal, like who isn't an Air Force, right? But there is no difference. So they kept saying there was a difference. There was no difference. And and so, you know, they, they keep lying. And that's not working for them anymore. It stopped working. It I mean, nobody wants to have anything to do with them. Nobody is, you know, they're they're allowed onto the media, but nobody's listening. Because people realize what a devastating impact they had on Israeli society, both in the 10 months preceding the war and since. You know, and now that this annual report just was made public, you know, this is also devastating. So what are you doing with the money? What are you, are you hoarding it? Are you planning on running for Knesset with it? What are you doing with this money? I mean, you know, you look at the donors abroad and you look at the donors in Israel. These people are not, you know, a lot of them, some of them are, you know, like-minded, anarchists, hate the right, hate Netanyahu, et cetera, a lot of them. Right? So say, you know, half of half of the money that's erased for people you can use it for whatever you want but the other half and i'm being and i'm being generous when i say half but say the other half you know 70 million shekels that they raise that's from people who agree with them that's from people who want to help the idea that's what people who want to help the kid would see that's from people who want to help the farmers right that that and so what is their money going to be used for those purposes? Has it been used? Where's the updated data on that? You know, if you're raising this kind of money from Jewish federations of North America, what are you using it for? Right? I mean, you have Moshe Cohen living in Brooklyn. He just gave $5,000 to the Jewish Federation of New York in order to support the IDF, support the people of Israel, support the people of the South, support the people of the North, and they gave it to you. What's the money being used for? That $5,000 wasn't yours. So, you know, these are things that are now coming out. People are tired of it. I'm sure that American Jews are probably going to be tired of it too when they realize that something weird is happening here. And so, you know, we should all make sure, right, that we know where our money is going to. Though, and, and by the way, the people in LA who were interviewed in the Channel 14 report, they said, yeah, that the money actually went to the units, thankfully. But again, it went with with their local. They want everybody to know that they raised the money. They didn't raise the money. The money was raised and people were forced to deliver it to brothers and sisters in arms because everybody said they had the best operation. And and now these people who have the best operation, what are they using the money for? So this is a really important story too, but it goes along with the with with sort of the bigger story, right? Which is Is right as it had, you know, the, the Nitzad alone, the, the uh, judge, justices in the Supreme Court, the military advocate general, 
uh, uh, of the IDF, the Attorney General of Israel, all these people thought that they were immune from criticism as they seized more and more powers, as they subverted the elected government, as they subverted the people's will, as it was manifested at the ballot box on November 1st, 2022, and as it's been shown in polls. They even put out polls that are push polls that tell them what they want to see, right? And and then they and then they repeat them, and then the New York Times posts them as a reason for the Biden administration to support their efforts to overthrow the democratically elected government of Israel, but before the war ends. But the people of Israel also have a say, and they're saying it louder and louder and louder, because we're you know. Tomorrow I'll be talking to David Wormser. It'll be going up later this week about what's going on with this war. We're at a critical moment in Israeli history, and everybody who stands in the way of victory at this point now is beginning to realize that people don't want to hear from them. They want to hear what they have to say. And it, things are changing in Israel, and I think they're changing for the better. They're changing for the better. They're, the, the politics are changing. So social situation is changing. And I think you're all changing for the better. I become more and more convinced that regardless of what happens in November, the United States, Israel's going to win this. And I'll just leave you with one last thing. Uh, Barack Ravid at Axios, who's basically the State Department stenographer with an Israeli accent. So he gave this report of Biden's interview or meet, a meeting with uh, Netanyahu. Uh, last Thursday night, which Biden already said was nasty. And I wrote about it in my article last Friday, which is that it was a very direct conversation, very direct. I was very direct. Da, 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 da. We want a hostage deal now. And so Barack Ravid gave further information and said that Biden essentially started swearing at him, don't BS me, but that was a BS, the actual words, et cetera. You know, uh, you can't treat an American president this way, et cetera, so that it was presented in the Israeli media as this, uh, Netanyahu again we're ruining our ties with Biden administration or whatever. So um, yesterday again, Channel 14, uh, they had more information. So it works out that Biden, after he said, "Don't BS me," this side and the other, he said, um, "You know, this war has to end. You know, it has to end now," or something like that. And so Biden says to BB. He says, uh, the time to end this war, uh, the time has come to end this war. And Netanyahu reportedly said, Mr. President, we will finish this war when we win it. And, you know, what's what's really remarkable about what's going on in the public sphere, again, is that he's not speaking for himself. He's speaking for the public that elected him. And the public that elected him has also started talking now. They're, they have, they've decided that the ground is no longer going to be controlled by a very large, a very small, sorry, but very politically powerful minority of Israelis, wealthy Israelis who think that they can lord their money and their, and their power over the public. It's not going to happen anymore. We've paid too high a price and we understand the stakes. It's just not going to happen. So I'm very heartened by the events of the past couple of weeks on the ground. You know, yeah, they're continuing to try to do what they want. And they're implementing independent policies, but it's more and more difficult for them when they realize, you know, that they're on notice. We're not going to take it anymore. We want to win. And we will, I'm sure. Of it. So I'll talk to you later uh, this week about how it's going to happen, what's going to happen, et cetera, and why we should all be scared, but uh, pretty assured and confident that we're going to, that things are going our way, despite everything. Those are my thoughts for today. Take care.